Didn't say port. I said land. Any land. Ah. Jack's hat! Clear about! No, no! Leave it! There were no hats left, but we went straight back to the original milliner in Rome, Peroni. They had the pattern, they made some more, and in this, in film two, uh, the hat has to end up in the water. So we moulded the hats, sculpted them, moulded them, and made them in rubber. So the props department have a whole set of these hats in rubber that float. Mine are leather. And it's supposed to float in the movie, and Penny gave me this hat and said, hey, here's the hat. Good luck, you know, it should float. And I put it in my bathtub and I left for five days. Actually, I left for 10 days. I went on the Scout uh, down to the Caribbean and I came back and it, there it was in my bathtub still floating. The leather is treated. It's rubberized leather, I think, is what Penny called it. I had six hats made for him when I very first met him. I laid them out on the floor and I waited until we'd, you know, gone some way with the rest of it. And then I said, you know, I put some hats together, what do you think? And he just went straight for this leather hat and he put it on his head and he said, this is my hat. And I said, well, you know, you should try some of the others on. He said, nope, this is my hat. And the only complication really is that with 7,000 costumes on this show, I don't know anybody else have a leather hat. And it's, you know, it's a material that I would have used a lot, but Johnny got it first, so it's Johnny's. And the next problem came with this, the coat. Because the coat is a lovely linen silk tweed, which has several different colors in it. And the shoppers, after four weeks, had given up and we were gonna to have to do something new. And everybody was very upset and nobody wanted to tell me and nobody wanted me to tell Johnny and what we were going to do. So um, I was speaking to Cosprop, the London costume house who make Johnny's costumes, lamenting the ability to find anything. One of its great benefits is that it's light. So it looks like a proper coat, but actually it's, it's pretty lightweight. Um, and the man who makes everything for us, Christopher, who is a great favorite of Johnny's, said, mm, there's something behind the sofa here. And I don't know what it is, it's been here for ages. And Christopher, go and have a look. And lo and behold, 50 yards of the coat fabric. So somebody somewhere knew we were gonna do it again. A great deal of what happens, happens in front of the mirror. And Johnny will just stand in front of the mirror, put it on, and it comes to him, you know. We don't obviously start with these garments. We start with just shapes. And, you know, do you want it longer? Do you want it shorter? Do you want the cuff bigger? Do you want the cuff smaller? All the details that we end up with happen that day in front of the mirror. And he knows immediately. He is very, very on the button about what works and what doesn't work. And at the end of the fitting, the original fitting, which took about 45 minutes only, he looked in the mirror and he said, there he is, there's Jack Sparrow. The only thing I changed was the shirt because the original shirt fabric was very, very flimsy and didn't stand up to all the stump work. So I got a, 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 a linen that was as thin but slightly tougher. And I think it might be a slightly different color, very, very slight. But you see, everything's got to match. The, the, where the fabric looks as if it's rotted, you know, making these tassels is a work of art. I know it sounds daft, but it's quite complicated. Every single thing is hand-stitched. So we just kick off immediately and make 12 of everything and be done with it. And that accommodates Johnny, the stump men, the photo doubles, anything else that comes across. Johnny's quite difficult because he likes to wear just the one outfit. It's the first number one and if he's going to get wet and you try to put him in number twos, no he wants to wear number ones. No Johnny, you please wear number twos. I think we've got 12 pairs of boots now. He only ever wants to wear his favourite pair and if he's going to get wet we have to persuade him and persuade him. They've been making holes in his boots so when he walks out of the water, the water can drain so he can walk. And then we do do a pair which have no sole or heel to them. They're just a spat that he can put over a neoprene underwater suit and look as if he's wearing boots because what happens if he wears the boots underwater is that the sole and the heel weigh him down. Can you get out, anything? 
and also, of course, the boot fills up with water. So these spats were brilliant because it meant that he looked as if he had his... Well, he did have his boots on, but the water wasn't catching. Here's his uh, sword. And the interesting thing about Johnny's, and he's very particular about this, he likes it. You see the little crook at the end of it. So um, um, I'm always trying to straighten it out, and he's like, no, 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 I like that. So uh, this is how you know it's Johnny's scabbard for his sword. This sword was bought again on P1. Chuck Stewart and Peter Cohen, the first AD, were on a trip to London, and I believe it was a store called Blunderbust Antiques. They picked this sword up, and this is from 1740s. It's beautiful. We've built hundreds of swords for this movie for a very talented sword maker in Los Angeles. And of all the swords we have, this one is actually the balance when it's in your hand, feels the best. And we didn't, I didn't even pick up on this until a few weeks ago when I was showing somebody the swords and I have Johnny's compared to all the others. But, you know, they talk about balance on guns or swords or fishing rods or whatever it is you have. You can actually tell it when you're holding this. It has a heavy in the back hand, so you get quick with the blade. What's interesting, it actually even happened to me before I got to, to know you a little better, is that it was more, I knew you better as John, I mean as Jack, that must happen all the time. You know what I mean, yeah. when people kind of run in, you know what I mean, they, yeah. they're more comfortable, or they know you better as just as Jack Sparrow, sure. than when it's John. It's very strange. I prefer Jack. <laughs> well, you don't have to stop playing him just because you don't have the wig on. Well, no, that's, that's, the, that's sort of one of the um, occupational hazards, but also a kind of gift in a way. You know, you get, you get to know these guys, you get to know these, you know, get to be these guys for a length of time. And, um, well, you get to like them, you know, they become, you become close with them, you know, and you get, and you get very comfortable being them. So what happens is, once you once you walk, the, you know, the ties have been severed from the film, it's over with, you walk away, you're still walking around with that character inside of you. Yeah. Going from Wonka back into Captain Jack mode. Once again, it was a, quite a bit of distance to travel, you know. But you do, for that period of time, I'm going to go for one second. You do uh, you find yourself in life reacting as those characters. Subconsciously, I mean, it just sort of happens, you know. <laughs> Believe me. Yes, it is. Going to a restaurant and ordering food, subcon you know, subconsciously, and it's just sort of Wonka kind of stuff. It's really <laughs> disturbing. I think this will blow up my can. I always do. It's like shaving your head every day and wondering if it's going to grow back. You know? <laughs> will I ever, will I ever be me again? We set about creating a 18th century pirate that looked like a rock and roll star. And when the wig went on and all the accessories, that's kind of what we got. Well, this is Johnny's wig. It's generally his look. Doesn't hasn't changed for Captain Jack. And um, it's it's kind of frayed in places and aged looking so that it's not too clean. Remember, he's a, a pirate. And then this is, you know, very nice, this beaded piece here. And this blue is a favorite of his. Always have to make sure that's showing in the shot. It's kind of specially made for Johnny, especially made in such a way that we can just put it on with the quickest time possible. You know, it just fits on like a hat for him. And basically, most of the time, he's just held on with the scarf, it, except that it fits him like a glove, so it stays on his head. Oh, we gotta have black. We gotta more, more have black. black. More black there, more black here. More black. This is an Ayurvedic stick that I had sent over from India. And it actually is supposed to help whiten the eyes while protecting them. Well, I mean, with any character, you, 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 uh, you gotta throw your own sort of ingredients, you know, into the stew pot. Like the, the black idea came from uh, the sort of nomads, you know. And, uh, well, Keith, Keith was being a nomad as well, but, uh, Berbers and stuff used to wear this stuff as protection 
in the desert. Yeah. So I figured a guy being on the so sea, he was almost like the football players of sort of modern day, you know, wearing the black there as protection from sun reflection. The Berbers wear this stuff to, yeah, sort of protect their eyes. So that's what I thought Jack would, uh, would have all that actually. Having spent some time with Keith Richards, who was certainly a, a huge part of the inspiration, you know, for, for the character. And he was definitely one of the main ingredients to the soup that is Captain Jack. And each time I'd see him, he'd have a new sort of thing tied into his hair, you know. And you'd be like, what, what is that? Goes, oh, yeah, I got that in, like, you know, Bermuda or wherever, you know. Yeah. See, oh, yeah. So I kept thinking of that, you know. So it felt to me like Jack, on his travels, on his adventures, he would either see something and go, oh, yeah, I'll keep that, you know, tie it in. So that each little trinket would have a story. Just above the bandana is a, it's a shin bone from a reindeer. And I'd looked at all these various things to tie into my hair. As soon as I saw that, I thought it was very interesting because it's kind of slightly dangerous, you know. But when they told me it was the shin bone of a reindeer, I thought, well, that's, that's got to be it. Because, you know, the stories that he could probably tell of the experience with the reindeer <laughs> would be uh, uh, too fun to pass up. How did your, the gold teeth work? So yeah, I just sort of went to the dentist and he, he bonded him. You know, he uh, sanded down my teeth and put these guys on there, bonded them on. So once the film is uh, finished, just, just go in there and he some weird process where he pops them off. Yeah. It's weird, you probably, then you wake up, I guess it happened on one too, you kind of wake up one day, look in the mirror and you're like, something's wrong, something's hey, missing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I still have, there's a couple of these are mine. These ones towards the back are, belong to me. So I have nothing else to go in their spot. I lost the other ones. I'm just kind of tricking the eye here, just so it appears that he has just a few more scragglers in here. So it makes it look a little, just a little scruffier. So I can't grow a beard. Just say it. Is that yeah. going to be straight, hey? Mm-hmm. Perfect. Yeah, we just started to, um, we just started to leave that. Because V has this unbelievable glue that, like, you could like semi-permanent. <laughs> could glue a you could glue a boat to water with this glue. It's pretty incredible. Can you find it? I put it in your finger. These things have had many incarnations in it. The dingles. Remember they started out with like, wires and paper clips oh, yeah. and stuff. Oh, yeah, and I remember we were doing that scene when you were in the cell. Yeah. And we had the wires in them, and you laid down, they went like this or something. <laughs> yeah. You're like crazy. They went, we said, oh, okay, well, no more wires. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Okay. Now, what happened? Well, it I, uh... It's loose. Why, do you feel something attached back there? <clears throat> no. Okay. Sometimes you feel like a little owl. Tweaky poo. Oh, that's good. Rocket. Okay. Rocket, baby. Let me okay. get this one long bugger. <laughs> Baby's back here. No, don't need, don't. These don't need to be back here either. No. Don't duck. Oops. Adam's apple. That's how you can tell I'm a man, isn't it? Madam. Yeah. Hey? All that eye makeup, you know? Let me see your hand. We wanted a little few points of interest. Now, this is one of the points of interest. This is a piece of old lace. And in a conversation with Johnny, we decided that it was a trophy piece from a young lady. This ring right here is a ring that Johnny bought in 1989. He was doing a photo cover shoot for Rolling Stone magazine. And so he saw this ring, bought it at a thrift store. And years later, when they go to do Pirates One, he, this is the ring that he wanted to use. So this was Jack's ring. 
in Pirates 1. One of four that he wears right now. Johnny has very strong ideas. He comes across, he has a lot of eclectic friends that he uh, comes across. Uh, this ring right here, for instance, is a replica of a ring that a friend of Johnny's had. It was from Greco-Roman, the Hellenistic period. It's about 2,400 years old, the original one. Johnny gave us the original one to make the replicas from, and uh, we got it back to him. Uh, ironically enough, that ring has been, it's been lifted, it's missing now. So the only rings that are in existence are these right here. We have this one, I think we have a few others. But uh, so this was an idea that Johnny had early on. Um, another one was this ring right here, which is getting pretty beat up. But he had this idea that he wanted to have a ring. He shagged a Spanish widow and uh, stole a ring on the way out the door. So that was the premise behind this ring right here. This is the dragon ring. I don't know exactly where this ring came from, uh, probably on some of his ventures to the Far East. But the interesting thing is, is when he, if you see him in, at Tia Dalma's shack, He's wearing this ring on his wedding finger, and he sees a bunch of jewelry laying out on the table, and he takes this off, and he steals this ring. He does a little trading, and um, right at the last minute, he goes and says, I can't lose this one, too, so he keeps all the rings. So he carries four rings, uh, most of P2 and all of P3. The first movie, um, the classical rum bottle that everybody sees are the onion bottles, is what they call them. They're short and round, and they're what we used in, the, in Pirates 1. This time around, Gore thought that he wanted to see something besides the onion bottle, and he just, he thought that when, when it's in your hand, and you're, or you're drinking it, that it was just something looked a little bit, it was a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. It's what you expected to see instead of this um, round onion at your face with a short neck. You know, they're hard to hold, they're hard to grab, and they're kind of stubby. Why is the rum always gone? So what we did was we had, um, we've got shelves of them over there, but we had bottles uh, hand blown of various styles. So you'll see five bottles mainly kind of rotate throughout the movie. Hey, ho, ho, ho. And a bottle of rum. <laughs> and then, you know, there's bar scenes and they have to be breakaways. So now you have to mold these, you have to make breakaways. And then you need rubber bottles. So we have rubber bottles and breakaways of a lot of these. Come on, who's fast? I just wanted the pleasure of doing that myself. Look. An undead monkey. Top that. This is the uh, Jack Sparrow pistol. This is made by a gunmaker out of London. His name is Perry. You can see it says it right here on the gun. This is um, another piece that was purchased from Chuck Stewart. He got bought a pair of them from a Connecticut antique dealer. This is around 1760s. I think that this is a, a beautiful piece. When you're shopping for antiques like this, the, uh, the hard thing is trying to find a double uh, match to it. And so you, when you go to purchase these and you can actually find a pair, that's a really big deal. Um, and a lot of the stuff from Pirates 1 doesn't even exist anymore, so we're really lucky that the original gun and the original sword, both guns actually, are still in existence. We have to have various versions. This is the rubber version. This is a little bit of the paint's worn off, so it's not as close as we like it usually. But this is something if Johnny's fighting and he's on top of a wheel and we don't want him falling or hurting himself or something that's uncomfortable. And again, most cases he prefers to use this one, but on the stunt guys, we would, you know, put this on most of the time. It's really cold. <laughs> it's a great gun, and again, when you hold this in your hand, you can feel the balance of it. There's a nice, small grip in the back. Feels uh, good to the hand. Um, uh, uh, something interesting about all these is, you know, you look at a lot of these movies that, uh, period movies that have guns and swords, and they're really fancy. They have a lot of fancy stuff and a lot of shiny chrome. And the thing that Gore has, uh, you know, his track record is he, he likes simplicity. He doesn't like things that are gonna be big and got in a lot of bling on them, uh, unless it calls for that. But in my experience, nine times out of 10, when Gore's picking a prop, he's gonna go for the, uh, the beauty and the simplicity of it. This is some poor, unsuspecting, manky, wild animal that got in his way and was probably then consumed. There's no telling where he got those. You know, it might have been lunch. It could have, you know, you never know. It could have been an old friend. And there are a couple of other things on his belt. A chicken foot and a fertility symbol. 
um, just because. This time he wears two belts instead of one, and that came about because he loved this buckle I showed him, and I said, well, I don't know, you know, it doesn't really go with the belt. He said, well, can I have two belts? Said, okay, have two. This compass does not point north. Where does it point? It points to the thing you want most in this world. This is the compass of Jack Sparrow, and when you were asking earlier about the greatest prop that he possesses, this is probably it. It's been a motivation of uh, the movies, I think, you know, uh, whatever your heart desires. This is the same compass from uh, Pirates 1. The only, uh, for the uh, French critics and the connoisseurs of Pirates 1, the difference of this one and the one in P1 is the dial has been changed. The one in Pirates 1 did not have the uh, red here. And the Gore's idea was that we needed something, at, because it was such a prominent prop in this movie, had to be a quick read and something that was really punchy. So that this has been added in the um, Compass Rose has been changed slightly. There's a couple different versions. We've tried putting magnets on the finger and you can take your finger and you can move it around on the bottom and it gets the Compass Rose to point in certain directions. So you don't see that on the off-camera side. Uh, we have some that have holes drilled in the side and they have mono coming out. And we have a, a wheel that's mimicked on the side. And so whatever the, uh, the off-camera person does over here, this, uh, the monofilament comes to the side and it can turn these any direction you want it to. Um, and then there's sometimes where it's just supposed to be spinning crazy, like uh, down in the Exumas when we shot um, Kira and Johnny down there. They, uh, we needed it to spin around, so we have another one that has a rod that comes out the bottom and you can literally do it like this and the CGI boys will paint it out. I know what I want. From Pirates 1, there were no costumes left. We didn't have any Jack Sparrows. So two problems arose immediately. There's a two-year gap. How do you refind everything identical? The first thing was going to be the sash. That was going to be the biggest, most complicated problem. This sash material, believe it or not, and this is nothing how it looks originally, is woven by some peasants in a village in the mountains in Turkey. And they'd woven me 50 yards in the first place, and then another 50 yards four years ago, but I didn't know where they were or who they were, and I couldn't find the agent. Eventually, somebody was sent to Turkey, and somebody was tracked down, and we found it. <laughs> so another 100 yards were specially woven, and you would say to yourself, well, why don't you silk screen it? You know, this is ridiculous, what a load of effort. But we do buy a lot of textiles in Turkey anyway, and there's something about the way this hangs and the way it beats up. I mean, when it's brand new, it's very red and very white, and it just, it shreds and ages so beautifully, and we just thought kind of, to keep the spirit of Jack Sparrow going, we better get the very same thing. It wouldn't be right if Jack didn't have keys to the Black Pearl to get into the rum cellar. So that's what these keys are. Early in the movie, he takes a trip down to the rum cellar, and he, that's where he meets uh, Bootstrap Bill. It starts off with size and what looks right in the hand and, and how many you're going to have, you know, be, so you can rummage through a few of them and then easily enough find the right one to put into the door. And he does it, you know, it has to be actor friendly also. You don't want um, to give them 20 keys and they can't find the right one. We did their feet, and then we put the booties on them, and then we did their booties, too. Can you get the back of them? Like, yeah, and rotate it, kind of turn around slowly. We didn't really know what Gore had in mind, because we had never really discussed it. It was just all of a sudden on the day Gore said, well, he should look like, you know, he should look kind of like, look like one of the cannibals now, or something. And I thought, okay, well, what's that supposed to mean? They all have bones through their nose and crazy stuff going on. And he says, well, I, I don't know, uh, paint a bug on his nose and put a bunch of eyeballs on his face. And I went, huh? So we went to the set and Joel and I kind of did it together. And he goes, no, here, Joel, paint a bug on his nose. So Joel painted a bug and he goes, okay, now put the eyeballs on. And that was our first day of doing that makeup. And I thought, I looked at Joel and I said, I never would have thought of that, would you? And he says, uh-uh. I painted the eyeballs really great so that they actually looked kind of resembled eyeballs with a little sparkle in them so that when they do the scene with his eyes closed, when he has his eyes closed, it even kind of fools me. I mean, when I first saw it, I went, oh, that's cool. And he opened his eyes and I went, oh yeah, that's right. He had him on his eyelids. You know, you kind of forget all of that until you actually see it happening. And I went, oh, that's cool. That looks cool.
Johnny came up with an idea that he wanted a toe necklace. And this is from discussions that he and Gore had been having. That's fantastic. Oh, is it one of those cartoons? The only thing that Someone comes to you and says, you know, hey, we need a toe necklace. You can't, there's no strip malls, there's no prop houses, and we have to rely on ourselves. And that's the great thing about a crew this size is really you can do anything you need to. This is, we went to V, Neil, and her department, and they, um, they molded some of these toes. They sculpted some of them. They took some of their bits and pieces of nails, and they put them in there. And you can see they even punched some hair in them. His scepter. Now, this is something that a friend of Johnny's had one day. He came to the set and visited. And it didn't have the bones and the, the uh, skull and whatnot on it, but it was basically what you're looking at, peacock feathers or whatever kind of bird this is. And Johnny liked it so much, he said, I, I really want to use this at Cannibal Island. So uh, his friend Sam, who works with his production company, actually made me two more of these. So we have three total.